um, if you're going to do so there. Uh, and we, I will hand over to you. And actually, I will hand over to you to introduce yourself as well and your current affiliations. I think that might be um, um, easier um, rather than I don't want to get it wrong. So please. <laughs> Sure, no problem. And thank you so much, Olivia, Rima, uh, Stacy, and everyone at JLI for putting this together. I've always intended to join uh, the groups, I think, especially since they started earlier this year, but unfortunately haven't had the chance. So thank you for welcoming me uh, to this first gathering and really looking forward to hearing your insights and feedback on this research and on a topical area that I think is of interest to uh, all of us, although it's, it's very niche. Um, it's really exciting to be uh, among a group of like-minded people. So um, I'm Diana Reyes. Um, I just started my PhD in international health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. It's also where I completed my master's in mental health, um, public mental health um, in 2016. Um, and since then I've been doing research on uh, global mental health, but also health system related research. Um, mainly in the Middle East with a focus on the Syrian regional response. Um, this, uh, the research that I'm presenting today is a result of some work I did um, in, for during my Fulbright um, in Germany uh, last year in Berlin um, on refugee mental health. And I looked specifically at faith-based coping methods uh, utilized by Arabic speaking refugees um, seeking mental health services in Berlin. And I did this in collaboration with the Charité University of Medicine, uh, where I worked with a group there that was doing a randomized controlled trial on mental health services catered to refugees and asylum seekers broadly. And I was lucky to, to work with a team of Arabic speaking uh, PhD students, as well as uh, psychology students who were um, looking at these issues specifically among the Arabic speaking population. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll jump right into the research and uh, looking forward to your feedback uh, towards the end. All right, so I'm sure most of you are aware of the um, of the uh, displacement crisis that occurred in 2015, in which Germany specifically welcomed uh, nearly 1 million refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Um, I had come across some studies regarding prevalence rates of mental disorders. Um, this one's from 2016, and it's a bit outdated, but it states that among refugees resettled in Germany, up to 50% uh, show prevalence of mental disorders, including PTSD, depression, and anxiety. I know there are ongoing prevalence studies uh, being done now uh, to, to update this number and, and to provide a more comprehensive understanding of prevalence among refugee populations. But um, I would say that this number uh, captured what I saw at least in person is up to 50% of those coming to our clinic, uh, well, mostly 100% coming to the clinic showed symptoms, but up to 50% of people I interacted with uh, were, were showing signs of distress, if not mental disorders. I mean, a lot of things contribute to uh, mental health conditions of refugees and asylum seekers um, arriving to Europe, including uh, previous uh, traumas experienced in their countries of origin, but also upon arriving to, uh, to Germany or to Europe more broadly, um, they experience a number of barriers, including the, the language barrier, which is one of the largest and I think most challenging for most people, but also lack of economic opportunities, um, feelings of lack of motivation um, in terms of integrating into a new society that's so different. They experience culture shock. And uh, among my own family members, um, I, I'm Syrian American and was born and raised in the US, but I have family who, who've been displaced to Germany um, in the last five years. And, and they had listed uh, many of these challenges among others in, in terms of integrating into the German context, uh, which is, is very different and polar opposite to, to the Syrian context in which they were raised in. So I thought this would be a useful visual just to see how, how significant a role Germany has played in, in uh, welcoming refugees from, from uh, all of these countries. And my interest was specifically in um, Muslims, uh, Muslim refugees and asylum seekers arriving to Germany, um, especially given the shift in the socio-political rhetoric regarding Muslims arriving and, and refugees and immigrants more broadly from Muslim majority countries. And there's a very interesting Pew Research Center study that projects the growth in Europe's Muslim population um, based on migration. And even with a zero net migration in the coming years, there's an estimate that by 2050, there would be a 7.4% increase in Muslims in, in Europe. And that's just due to um, you know, birth rates and, and, and the arrival of, of refugees um, in the last five years or so. Um, so I thought this is a very interesting precedent to, you know, to look at 
um, the integration of Muslims in Germany, uh, largely, not just among refugees and asylum seekers, and how individuals who've arrived to Germany in the last uh, 10 years or so have um, really found it either difficult or, or more um, easy to, to integrate into German society, given their religious backgrounds and cultural backgrounds. Um, and I came across some research on faith-based coping specifically, or how people use religious or spiritual beliefs to um, interpret traumatic events that have happened to them. And uh, this also comes from some of my own personal experiences growing up as a first generation Syrian American in the US and having um, grown up in a community that had fled uh, traumas in the 80s and come to the US and had integrated um, uh, with, by uh, expanding and finding other communities that shared their religious beliefs. And um, other research that's been done by uh, mental health and global mental health experts have found that there is a broader need for integration and social support for refugees from Muslim majority countries to help overcome sudden changes following displacement. And this can usually come from um, a, a similarly um, similar background, a group of similar background or, or religious beliefs that can help uh, provide social support for these individuals. So in terms of framing this study, um, what I did was I wanted to explore the manifestation of spiritual religious coping strategies, which are also called faith-based coping strategies, encompassing both spiritual and or religious. And um, at first I was looking at the Syrian refugee population, but I noticed that the clinic that we were working at was seeing uh, refugee and asylum seekers coming from uh, both Syria and from Iraq. So I expanded the research um, aim to include both Arabic speaking to include all Arabic speaking refugees that we were seeing. And these were all adults over the age of 18 who were, who were coming to the clinic. And uh, so what I did was I would um, interview, do qualitative interviews to identify any faith-based coping strategies that were shared by the participant. And uh, the research analysis was really looking about, looking at how faith-based coping strategies could be favorable and, and can be optimized from a service delivery perspective and also in terms of integration policy. So breaking some of the text here with a visual, um, this is my colleague Dana, who's a psychology student um, at the University of Constance. And um, this is how we would do the recruitment for, for the study, the broader study that I was a part of at the Charité. Um, and this is a shower must stop uh, shop in, um, in Arab Street in uh, Sonen Ale in Berlin. And uh, we would paste these uh, notices about seeking mental health services at the clinic um, and uh, provide email and, and phone numbers for people who are interested in participating in the study. And as I mentioned earlier, the Mahira study or Mental Health and Refugees and Asylum Seekers project led by the Charité was a randomized control trial across Germany looking at refugee and asylum seeker adults, both um, um, Arabic speaking and Farsi speaking, who were seeking mental health services in Berlin. And um, I used a specific study sample from this group, um, as I mentioned before, Arabic speakers only, um, and also those screened using the PHQ-9 and Refugee Health Screener um, who demonstrated depressive symptoms. So these were people who had mental health symptoms and were seeking services to resolve them. And um, my research question was really aimed to look at these perspectives on spiritual and religious coping and looking at how this impacted well-being and ability to integrate into German society. Um, so fortunately, I was able to conduct um, 17 interviews in Arabic with uh, 11 males and six females between the ages of 20, 22 and 47. And uh, all interviews took place in the private mental health clinic in central Berlin that was sponsored by the Charité. And this occurred between uh, December 2018 and April 2019. And this feels like a lifetime ago. Um, all participants happened to identify as Muslims. I did not seek out Muslim participants. Um, I mainly asked individuals who were interested in participating in the study um, and uh, also had the time to participate because this was, these interviews were usually conducted after a long battery of tests that were given to um, each participant participating in the um, Mahira trial. Um, two of the participants happened to identify as non-religious or non-practicing Muslims, but still categorized themselves as Muslims. Uh, we also noted reasons for migration, and this really varied among participants, um, but most of them had fled ongoing war and conflict in, in both Syria and Iraq, um, as well as political and or religious persecution. Um, in terms of technicalities, the transcripts were translated to English from Arabic by me, um, and I conducted all the interviews in, in Arabic, and I analyzed them using 
um, Max QDA um, to highlight thematic patterns, and I used a grounded theory approach to incorporate the life histories of these individuals. So the findings were structured into four themes, which have, um, in terms of feedback that I've gotten so far on the piece and can hopefully resolve in the, in the review process, they, they read more as categories. So um, I welcome your feedback after you've, you've seen these different categories and thinking about how they could be shaped into themes. But the first was faith-based coping during flight. So um, types of spiritual and religious coping that were shared by participants uh, during their displacement. And then um, the other category that I looked at was changes in faith practices upon, upon arrival. So those who had come to Germany, if they'd had um, either increases or decreasing uh, decreases in their faith practices. The third category is faith-based coping methods to address distress, which was sort of the core of the research um, that, that I was um, considering and, and interested in. And um, the last theme um, addressed advice to German mental health providers and how, um, and, and this could be broadly applied to non-Arab uh, non or Western mental health providers um, in terms of advice to address faith-based coping in, in mental health care. Um, in terms of key results, most participants um, endorsed their faith as a positive source of comfort and reassurance. And this included uh, your classic examples, such as attending religious services, making supplications at home, um, and seeking help from a religious leader. But um, other things that I think were surprising to me were um, how much people uh, relied on meeting other Muslims or other refugee uh, populations that were similar to, their, to them. Um, and in terms of the, uh, another key finding, participants expressed preference for Arabic speaking mental health professionals, although they didn't have to be Muslim. I think this had a lot to do with individuals being able to speak to a mental health provider who could understand their background without having to explain um, or go into too much detail when seeking mental health services. Um, so I thought I would share some quotes um, from each of the themes. Um, I think they speak um, much, much broadly, much more broadly about this issue than, than I ever can, and they're very powerful. Um, so these were extracted during the analysis, and, and for the first theme about faith-based coping during flight, um, although many of the participants had different ex experiences in, in their migration journeys, some had left by boat, some had come by plane and had visas, um, so it's very, very uh, variable um, among the participants. Some participants expressed that the challenges they faced were really balanced by their faith in God and the destiny that was uh, chosen for them or preordained. Um, so this quote here is from a participant from Iraq, and he said that once we took off by boat in the ocean, I asked God, if I have a place in this world, let me and my entire family to arrive. If you have written for someone in my family to drown, let me drown in their place. I hope I arrive to Germany in peace and safety. And if that anything was going to happen, it would be me instead of someone in my family. Um, so you can see here that a lot of people um, uh, or individuals who had experienced a very traumatic displacement journey, and I think this, is, this emerges also in the photos um, that were released in 2015 during the migration crisis, you can see that people had suffered a lot of anguish. So it was not surprising to me at least to see that faith-based coping was utilized uh, during these difficult journeys. And another participant, um, and I won't read the quote, but you're welcome to, but another participant uh, or two um, had said that they were really grateful to God having survived the journey and felt that when they arrived to Germany that they had to increase their faith practices in order to compensate for, for the gift that God had given them in, in terms of arriving. Um, the second theme was changes in faith practices upon arrival, and I think this one was the most unexpected for me. Um, although I expected people to um, have uh, had some sort of, um, I think, revolutionary experience in terms of being in a new country and experiencing a new culture, um, I think the self-reflection was something that um, was really interesting, in term, especially among men, as um, for the first time they had left their country of origin, they were exposed to a culture that was quite the opposite of uh, specifically Muslim culture um, in, in their country of origin. So a lot of participants, um, when asked that if they had to change their faith practice in order to integrate better um, in, into German um, culture or, or society, um, a lot of people um, had said that, if, that they didn't think integration was contingent on their faith or them changing themselves in order to feel accepted um, in German society. And I think this quote um, captured this um, comprehensively. This was from a Syrian male adult. Um, he said, if a German is to accept me, they will accept me as I am. I'm not going to change so someone else can accept me. 
for those who are changing religiously, ethically, or culturally for others to accept them. I think that when Germans see someone like this, such as someone drinking alcohol in violation of their religious beliefs, then they will not respect them. So I thought this was really interesting um, because a lot of individuals when asked about themselves uh, tended to um, talk generally about others. So instead of, and it felt like a little bit of deflecting um, on their own experiences and, and sort of generalizing what the refugee community had experienced more broadly. Um, so I, I noticed that a lot of people were in this, in this phase where they were struggling with their faith. They were trying to, um, to see how they could adapt their faith in ways to better integrate into German societies, but also how to hold on even more strongly to, to faith practices. And we've seen this in the literature and I've seen this in, in Muslim communities here in the US as well. So I noted this, that few participants became more stringent in their beliefs and particularly in their awareness of God or the significance of their faith now being in a country that was non-Muslim. Um, so I'm going to delve deeper here on the theme of faith-based coping and, and provide more examples of how individuals thought faith-based coping helped them address their, their distress. Um, and some participants mentioned that the importance of remembering and thinking of God was really helpful for them. So um, this was a lot of self-reflection among, among participants, people who were mainly on their own or maybe had come with their family, but were still experiencing a very individual process in terms of how um, they can cope with their mental health um, condition. Um, oh, so one participant from Syria, a female participant said that her faith in God is what keeps me going. I'm convinced that the world is temporary. So you know that there's something that is true in the world, which is the Quran, the holy book. Um, and she goes on to describe that, that she found a lot of um, uh, a relief in her belief in God and that um, she just thinks of the hereafter where there would be no anxiety, no sadness and no depression. This is something that comforts her. Um, other people had uh, mentioned that they, they feel a sense of calm when they read Quran, when they pray or they supplicate. And as I mentioned um, and hinted at before, I, I felt like a lot of people who had come on their own to Germany were using these very individual forms of, of coping with supplicating at home, praying at home or reading Quran and remembering God um, to help uh, cope with some of the distress that they were feeling. Um, two participants shared their thoughts on how faith-based methods of coping should be supplemented with medical treatment. Um, and although in Syrian society, allopathic me medicine is, is very much well regarded, um, as well as in Iraqi society, um, depending on, on especially the, the rural or, or, or urban parts of the country that, that these participants come from, um, I, felt like, I felt like this was useful to note is that um, even those who, who had uh, strong beliefs or, or were attached to their faith, um, said that medical treatment was important to be supplemented um, as well as faith-based coping methods. So um, this person put it well, they're from Iraq. They said, I know people who use religion for everything. God said, for everyone who tastes, there is medicine. God says, ask for help, my worshiper, and I will help you. If you want to seek treatment, and I will help you find it through your prayer, I will make the heart of the doctor feel for you. The pharmacist will help you. Um, and if I'm sitting at home and wait for God to treat me, God will not send us treatment in an envelope. Um, so I thought this was interesting to note um, since um, most of these people uh, not only relied on their faith practices, but had already come actively to seek treatment in a clinic. Um, in terms of social support systems, a few participants shared that there was a lack of mosques nearby. Um, and although this is not necessarily the case in Berlin, uh, there are plenty of mosques catering to Muslim populations um, in, in Berlin. Broadly, uh, some of these mosques are more for Turkish speakers or um, are, are much smaller and, and catered to a specific ethnic group. Um, so a lot of individuals mentioned that there were no mosques near their house, and, and this also included mosques that included Syrian um, or Iraqi um, uh, communities that they felt comfortable around. Um, so this was an interesting finding is that if uh, if there were more mosques near uh, some of the homes of these participants that they thought that it would help them um, just in order to have access to an imam or a cleric uh, to help speak about their mental health situation or find uh, a social support system outside of their home. And on the topic of religious clerics, um, some participants had noted that, that, they, that they had sought help from a religious cleric before coming to the mental health clinic. Um, and some had found it useful and some had uh, found it not so useful, which is why they had sought mental health services uh, at the Charité. 
Um, so I thought this was really interesting. This quote was from a female participant um, from Syria. And uh, she said that when she tried to ask for help about her depressive symptoms, the religious cleric told her to just pray and to be patient and ask for forgiveness. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think that this, this participant was very self-aware and had said that um, she, you know, she didn't find that this, this advice was useful. And um, so she wanted to find an alternative solution by seeking medical care. And the last theme or category was advice for German mental health providers. And I asked this question directly. Um, I wanted to know what participants would like from a non-Arab or non-Arabic speaking um, Western um, or German mental health provider to, to know about their cultural or spiritual backgrounds in order to optimize mental health treatment. Um, and so these um, quotes here from participants talk about um, the importance of German mental health providers knowing um, about Arab culture and understanding uh, how family, for example, is really important um, in Arab culture. And I think this expands to um, um, Muslim faith principles as well. Um, and the other thing about to note about this is that uh, participants knew um, that someone who had an Arab background would also understand the context of their displacement and also uh, what they had witnessed or had suffered um, in terms of integrating into German society. So actually one of the psychiatrists in the clinic was Syrian and he'd arrived um, before the, the Syrian conflict um, to Germany, but at least participants felt comfortable around him because he understood um, sort of the, the, the background and the socio-political context that they had fled. So as you can see in this, this uh, study, it was an exploratory study just to see what faith-based coping methods were, uh, could be identified among refugee and asylum seekers in Germany. Um, and you, you see a wide spectrum, even among those um, who participated in the study and identified as Muslims, that there's a wide spectrum of definitions and interpretations of faith. And a lot of them have been shaped by individual and traumatic experiences, uh, which extend into the integration processes. And um, I noticed and didn't note during the result while well, sharing the results, but there were some differences between males and females and females uh, demonstrated a greater reliance on faith based coping mechanisms. Um, and although I'm not sure exactly why this is, um, it could be that since um, aspects of Islamic faith are very individual. Um, that females are who are already used to praying at home, maybe not going to a mosque or uh, making supplications on behalf of their family, just continue to do this um, and continue to expand on this in their new context. Um, male participants also expressed a lot of distrust and um, dissent from uh, religious forms of social support in Germany, such as um, seeking mental health services from Arab providers or um, from religious clerics. Um, they also expressed distrust about mosques in general in Germany, since they didn't understand or knew where some of the imams or the religious clerics um, had come from and what their intentions were. And um, I think that this study really demonstrates the importance of considering faith and alternative forms of coping. Um, and I think especially in, in a system like the German health system, it can also introduce alternatives to sort of the not only linguistic barriers, but the sociocultural barriers that are posed by uh, German and also other Western health systems. I included a slide here on implications for practice, and this is specifically relevant to clinical providers who are working with these populations. Um, I think that the findings uh, demonstrate that mental health service provision can be optimized to address gaps in culturally sensitive health care for refugee populations in Germany um, and also other Western host country contexts. And, um, the themes that I've highlighted here can be translated into strategies to improve mental health interventions, accounting for faith-based coping mechanisms. And like I said, this is an exploratory study, but at least it gives us a foundation of, of where people are at, um, especially in terms of their integration. Um, I'm also very passionate about expanding and broadening integration policies that can accommodate cultural, economic, and spiritual needs of these communities. And this is something I'm planning um, to continue studying uh, during my PhD and, and dedicating my dissertation to, um, and, and likely in the German context in um, Sweden as well as the US. And um, these findings are hopefully very relevant for mental health professionals, NGOs, and humanitarian aid agencies engaging with these populations um, in, um, in Europe and Muslim majority countries, people for individuals coming from Muslim majority countries. And hopefully it's useful um, for individuals like you who've dedicated your research to 
um, looking at faith and development and how it overlaps with um, health and, and accommodating um, individuals from different countries and new host country contexts. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope I didn't go over time, um, but I'd really uh, like your feedback and really looking forward to the discussion as I continue to build on this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, that was great. And um, I think we are able to um, get a good overview of the whole process of the study there and how the results might be relevant for us. Um, so I will hand over to Susanna for um, a quick response um, before we go to the Q&A. Uh, Susanna. Hi, everyone. Hi, Diana. Thank you so much. It was really interesting to hear about your study and, and, and to read it. Um, I am actually in Berlin, so... <laughs> oh, great. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a visiting researcher at uh, Humboldt University's research program on religious communities and sustainable development. So I'm here, I've been here for a few years. Um, I was here already um, since 2010, then I went away, then I came back, but now I'm here. You know. um, so, and it's very interesting to hear about um, what happens on, uh, on the ground and, and what happens to these people who arrived and then and they were uh, very much talked about and then uh, now they're not as much uh, mm -hmm. under the spotlight as they were a couple of years ago. Uh, and I think in general also um, the, the, the theme of uh, the roles that faith and, and, and faith uh, practices play uh, in, in psychosocial support and in spiritual support uh, for uh, asylum seekers and for refugees, for displaced people in general is, is very, very important and, and, it, and also has been highlighted um, and is a growing, uh, there's a growing body of work that uh, kind of points to that, uh, those roles and, and, and how valuable they can be. Um, I mean, there was already um, in the humanitarian sector uh, in 2007, the interagency standing committee uh, suggested that faith actors uh, should be engaged in, in, uh, in providing um, psychosocial support or in the provision of psychosocial support um, in contexts of emergency and in humanitarian contexts. But then uh, reading your piece reminded me of uh, quite a few studies that um, uh, a few examples of, of those um, practical roles uh, that, that faith actors played, for instance, with refugees in the UK, uh, with faith communities mobilizing to support, to provide not only practical support, but also spiritual support. Um, and in particular, I remembered a, um, a literature review that um, Piloch uh, wrote about um, how re resilience in children is fostered by um, by faith and, and, and by, by the um, by their own faith and, and, and their faith practices and the, the, the faith communities um, um, that they belong to and the, there were examples in that uh, in that review from uh, from Somali refugees uh, to Burundian and Liberian refugees uh, to Sudanese refugees in the in the US and in, in, in other places mm -hmm. um, and then there was another study that uh, came to mind um, about uh, IDPs in Kenya and about survivors of, of gender-based violence and sexual violence and how these women it was uh, it was women who organized, self-organized in, in groups, uh, and they were um, um, praying and, and sharing um, um, various religious practices and also having um, Bible readings. It was Christians in, in, in that case, but they were also uh, supported by religious leaders. And as you said, that was really a way for them to to cope with the trauma and, and to process it and to feel as they, um, that they belong to, to a group and that they could share that, um, that process together. Uh, and in that case, actually religious leaders also somehow cooperated with humanitarian actors uh, on the field. And so that was a kind of interesting example of 
um, some kind of cooperation that maybe is also needed in your case, of course, in a very different context, but um, similar at a certain level. Um, I also I also thought about the fact that some other studies do uh, also uh, outline some challenges that are uh, um, present when when faith actors and faith is um, engaged in, in in psychosocial support and um, in Germany in particular there was a study that um, pointed out how that might also uh, mean that there is an exposure for some people to some risks of radicalization or of um, being controlled by um, especially especially regarding women um, by the faith communities or, or, or by part of the faith, faith communities mm. um, but yeah um, uh, let me see if there's something I, I'm, I'm forgetting. Mm. Yeah, I think I think one other point that I would I would say in terms of possible challenges um, is is about the fact that sometimes it happens that um, religion has, in this context at least, uh, from what I've read and from my experience. It, it, religion becomes also something that you have to perform. So um, it might be in some contexts that if you are identified uh, as someone who belongs to a certain religious community and, and, and then needs a certain type of psychosocial support or spiritual support uh, that fits that uh, kind of um, group, then then you, you or identity, then you, you also have to uh, show that you yeah. that you fit uh, yourself fit in the description of, uh, exactly. of Muslim refugee or Muslim, and and this leads me to, to my my question. Um, so I also worked as a as a social worker in Italy. Uh, the refugees that I work with or the asylum seekers that I work with came from not from Syria nor Iraq, but they mostly came from. Um, from Africa, from Senegal, Gambia, Nigeria, and, uh, and in that case, so in the Italian system, uh, mental health is often also, for, for asylum seekers and refugees, is also um, connected to the provision of services. So if sometimes it happens that if you have a mental health issue, it will be easier for you, if that's recognized by the system, that it will be easier, easier for you to access certain types of services. Um, so there's always an issue of trust, which you also partly addressed, I think, um, between, between asylum seekers and, and, uh, and mental health uh, professionals, uh, mm -hmm. let alone uh, refugee status determination uh, officers, which, mm -hmm. but that's another issue. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. there's always this issue of trust that you have to, um, you, you have to demonstrate that you're not uh, faking your mental health issue and they, and at the same time, uh, it's really hard to, to, to talk about certain issues with people who are, don't have necessarily have the knowledge. And in that case, in the case of Italy and of these asylum seekers, it was even worse because it was about religious traditions themselves. So it was um, often about juju or uh, mm -hmm. witchcraft mm -hmm. stories that were for, for mental health officials very hard to, to understand, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was just wondering if, if this issue of trust is also something that you came across and, and what you think about it. And, uh, and then the second question, and then I'm done, I'm sorry, I'm saying it uh, long, but uh, it's about the, the gender dimension. You, you, I was very curious if, if, you, if you could say, uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about what that meant also in terms of accessing the services, whether you think it was um, um, for women and for men, it was equally uh, viable or, or if they felt uh, comfortable enough, if the, there was an issue there also about gender between, between service providers and, 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 and asylum seekers. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you yeah. very much.
Thank you, I know it's so great to know that you're in Berlin and that you've um, worked with these populations before. Um, you're right to say that um, this issue was on everyone's radar a couple years back, but now I can only imagine that, especially with coronavirus, that these issues have been forgotten. Um, and I know, at least with the work that we were doing, that funding was running out um, from the Ministry of Health for the clinic, and I believe it's been shut down since. So it really makes me think what you know services are now um, remaining for these populations, especially five years in. Um, everybody wants to paint the picture of integration as really perfect and people are working and they're going to school but um, from what I saw was that people were really suffering um, as a consequence and that they needed a very specific kind of help um, whether it was social support or religious support or you know any anything related to um, improving mental health services. Um, so I'll, I'll start with your question on trust um, and welcome others to provide more real life examples because I think it's really interesting to hear about different contexts as well. And this, the German context is, is so unique in that you have so many people who have arrived all at once. And um, you would think that refugee uh, communities, say in Berlin, um, of Syrian origin would be more connected. Um, but it's actually, it was shocking to me how, to see how um, much of a, there was a lack of cohesion between the refugee community itself. And I'm not sure if it's because people are afraid of one another or they're ashamed of one another, or they just have fled so much trauma that they don't want to engage with refugee populations now and there. They want a fresh start, so they want to, ch to turn the page. Um, so that issue of trust extends not only to other members of the refugee community, but also to mental health providers and, and especially people, um, even those who are Arabic speaking um, or of Syrian or Lebanese or Iraqi origin in the clinics. So I was fortunate to work with both. I mentioned the Syrian psychiatrist. There was also a Lebanese psychiatrist, Lebanese German psychiatrist who was seeing these patients. And I would say that they, they just had more, they were, it was more, it was easier for the patients to establish rapport with these, with these um, um, clinicians and were able to, to sort of share their mental health symptoms and focus on their symptoms rather than explain why they were feeling these symptoms. With the German mental health providers, I wouldn't say that it was a lack of trust, but it was just that, that extra effort of feeling like you had to explain you know, why you're feeling this way to justify your feelings and your symptoms. And also to, um, there's always a translator present, right? So then they have to like channel all of their emotions and their traumas through the translator who is all Arabic speaking, but they might not trust them um, either just because of these issues I highlighted at the beginning of like arriving to a new place and wanting to be to other yourself and to distance yourself from um, individuals from your country of origin. So it's, um, it's very tricky. And, and I mean, there was also the opposite situation where individuals found that they could speak more openly to a German mental health provider because you know they didn't have any biases of, of who they are, where they come from. And I think the origin of this is that a lot of people were politically uh, or religiously persecuted in their country of origin, which is why they've sought asylum. And that's something that we need to consider um, in terms of developing interventions. Um, so on um, your second um, question on the gender dimension um, in terms of accessing services, uh, just to paint a picture for you, I mean, we had more men in the clinic, I think for sure, because men were, you know, could, could leave their house more freely. They were able to access transportation um, and Berlin metros and, and to arrive to the clinic um, sort of undetected by their family members. Whereas any of the, fam uh, the female patients that we saw, their family was informed that they were suffering. I mean, they'd reached such a, you know, such a state where they really needed mental health services and they had to tell their family or had somebody babysit their kids in order to arrive to the clinic. Um, and so that just shows that um, there is, in terms of access, there's already this disparity where, where women have to be more public about their symptoms and that they need help, whereas men can sort of go undetected. And, and there was one patient from Iraq who, you know, he didn't tell his, his wife that he was seeking mental health services for his insomnia. Um, so I think that, that access issue is huge. Um, there's also the, the difficulties of, you know, most, most mental health providers that were in the clinic were men, German or non-German. Um, and so the female participants um, weren't always comfortable um, seeking mental health services from a, from a male psychiatrist. But there's, a, frankly, a lack of Arabic speaking female psychiatrists in Berlin. So that was another issue in terms of access. Um, those are really great questions. I'll also open it up to others if they have any. We have um, a question from Thank you. Oh, Sorry, go ahead. 
Behind you, you're muted currently. Hello? Hello? You hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yes. yes. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Diana, for yes. this interesting yes. presentation and research. And actually, your results uh, actually resemble our results. Uh, we did a research on uh, Muslim women in Syrian context in Turkey and inside Syria about the role of faith. And actually, it's like, uh, again, confirm how important faith a coping mechanism uh, uh, to uh, to help them overcome trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, what I want to highlight, actually, this is a um, sad thing, actually, that I want to raise because you may be interested on in this. Uh, I have been working in Syrian context. I'm a psychiatrist myself uh, and a refugee myself. I have been working in Syrian context for 10 years since it, is, it is started. And so far, we had a lot of curriculums, a lot of trainings, but never had any training or mentioning of any faith component in uh, psychosocial support. Never, ever. And uh, that results in, in, in a state of where uh, Muslim clients visit Syrian mental health professionals in a Muslim countries in Syria or in Turkey but they don't talk about faith at all, because if they talk about faith, this could be considered uh, a break of neutrality. And this is actually a very sad, the way that we are living in. We are being prevented from uh, having the service that uh, 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 like match our, our preferences, our culture, our, our needs. So, so I think, things in Germany may be better than what we are facing now inside Syria or in Turkey. So this is very sad. That's the second thing is, uh, even when uh, we approach faith, we approach it from perspective of um, general psychology, which is Western psychology, secular psychology. But we see it like uh, maybe our culture is like different. Faith is different than what is being seen. So even the research, the paradigms, the definitions of well-being, uh, mental health, all these issues are, are different. So this is another area that I think we need to start to think about it, like to start to craft new theory, theories and build our research on it so we can understand it uh, in, in different way. So this is some uh, only a few thoughts that I want to share, uh, share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. It's a pleasure to meet you. And I've definitely come across your work before um, in, in Turkey and inside Syria. So thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I, I agree completely. And I think that's where a lot of the motivation um, came from for, for me to pursue the study, especially in the German context, which is um, especially in a city like Berlin is extremely secular. So I was really curious how these individuals were able to cope and in, in, in experiencing, first of all, such a different culture. Um, but then also in terms of having access to mental health services or even uh, social support or religious support from um, religious institutions that were addressing um, this issue in a very secular society. Um, so I agree completely, this break in neutrality is something that's very stigmatized, even in the Arab and Muslim world. Um, and I, I mean, I can imagine um, already, I, I remember a conversation I had with a Syrian psychiatrist uh, who studied in Damascus that you know, if somebody, if a psychiatrist told a patient to go home and to pray more, I mean, that would be ridiculed, right? But then if somebody's told, you know, just go and take this medication, then their full needs aren't technically being addressed, especially if they are religious or they do believe that, you know, God has a plan for them. So it's a really tough balance to strike. And I think we're working in a context like in Europe where individuals don't, maybe no, don't even really know what Islam is or what, what has happened in Syria or what happened in Iraq and why their patient might be feeling this way. So maybe we shouldn't be afraid to kind of um, break this neutrality in some ways. And, and I agree that putting together theories or, or putting out studies like the, the ones that you're doing um, or, or this one that start the conversation um, on, on faith-based coping and why it should be normalized. Um, on your second point um, in regards to uh, the secular approach to faith, um, I also wanted to mention a point that 
um, sometimes this isn't just a faith issue. And actually I had a really hard time in interviews dissecting what was faith and what was culture and traditions. Like people in, in the interviews, um, I think were reflecting for the very first time on like, what are their faith practices and what are things they just do because it's a part of their culture or they're just expected to, you know? So for example, prayer could be one of them. If you grew up in a, in a um, Muslim majority country and you hear the prayer, the call to prayer five times a day and you're a male, you might be expected to accompany your father or another you know, elderly man in the family to pray. Um, and then now you're in this context in Germany where you don't hear the call to prayer. No one's around to remind you. Are you planning on, on uh, praying out of your own will or is this something that is expected of you in, in, from a more cultural sense? So it was really hard in, in the interviews and I hope to expand on this in future research is also to differentiate between cultural and religious practices. Thanks. Um, we have a, a time for a few more questions. I know there are, there are definitely people on this call who studied this area too. So um, uh, any other questions, just feel free to um, questions or reflections as well from your own um, research or um, experiences. Um, please feel free to unmute uh, now. Hello, Olivia. Um, it's Corolla here. Um, hi, Diana. It's really interesting to, to hear your contribution. Um, as you were speaking, I was just uh, reflecting around. So I'm a, I'm a psychologist. I, I work in MHPSS with uh, conflict uh, affected populations, mostly not in high income settings. Um, but um, what's been really interesting is, is lately, over the last few years, looking at the role of daily stresses. So, you know, looking at um, the lives that people live following displacement and the very real challenges they have in terms of, you know, you know the, the, the aspects of integration, like finding a job, getting access to education, the language that you mentioned, all of those things, um, and those causing considerable stress. Um, as opposed to the kind of focus on once-off trauma events or not once-off, but, you know, even sometimes very long periods of, um, of oppression, of, of violence, um, you know, of displacement and so on. Um, and I was wondering if you had any reflections on the role of faith-based coping in terms of not just the kind of the, the, the stronger end of the, of the MHPSS continuum, um, but also looking at the daily challenges of life and, and integration and how faith helps the, um, the people you were talking to in regard to that. Thanks, thanks, Carola. That, that's a really important question um, and something that I think emerged um, in, in some of the interviews, um, especially when talking to individuals about their general state of well-being and, and that they um, had they found a job, were they able to um, study the language, were they feeling motivated? And a lot of them would, um, any, any reward or any positive um, advancement that they achieved in terms of um, integration into German society, um, out of the participants I interviewed, a lot of them cited that this was, you know, God's plan for them or that, um, you know, they were really grateful that this was what was uh, predestined or written for them in terms of achieving these goals, but also that if they were suffering from any challenges that their patience was, was um, guaranteed or, or rewarded by God. So um, I also wanted to mention the individual who said that she remembers God when she walks. So she's like walking around. Uh, Berlin. She's exploring the city. She's trying to really understand where she is and orient herself. And she found that remembering God um, or maybe making supplications in her head was really helpful. Um, but in terms of like specifically considering how faith um, is incorporated to general um, distress or um, achievements in integration, I think it's really hard to tease out. And like it would, it would take like either a very accurate um, tool or um, you know, very targeted interviews to ask these questions because I found that most people weren't really aware themselves like how their faith was helping or maybe not helping them so much in, in their integration. But it's something that I'd like to dedicate my career to and I think um, others on this call might have useful insights um, from other contexts. Thank you very much, Dana. You're welcome. Kind of thinking a, a little bit along the lines of, um, you know, also 
talking about the sort of social aspects, um, you know, belonging to a faith community, um, and that kind of really being part of what brings people in, um, you know, and and sort of yeah, looking at, at at the kind of structural elements of being part of a of a faith community. So so not only the kind of intra psychic oh, right. faith, you know, rather than the the kind of those aspects as well. Um, that people sometimes mention. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Oh, and on that note, I just wanted to mention that a lot of individuals who weren't reunited yet with their families did cite that um, having their families present, if they had come from, if they were able to come from Syria or from Iraq, um, that that would help improve their mental well being, I think, significantly, is having that close uh, form of social support around them. And family was always cited, family and children were, it was sent, were cited as some of the main components there. Any other questions? Well, please feel free to put them um, on the chat or on mute. I have a question um, in the meantime, um, which is around just your final final point on your final slide about the relevance to um, NGOs and humanitarian response. I think that um, you know, one of the things that comes across is just, and, and you mentioned several times, is how much this is an individualized and personal um, process of reflection on people's faith and even the way that um, 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 people's faith is practiced is quite individual in many ways. And I think that the things that we've found, what I've seen anyway from a lot of maybe the MHPSS research that has come out um, around faith um, uh, um, and psychosocial response is that we see this individual response, but it's kind of hard for humanitarian NGOs to latch on to what to do with that. I think obviously very clearly we have recommendations around um, moving away from secular paradigms that mean that faith is not involved at all, you know, that's a clear um, interpretation, but, you know, linking into an individual's um, personal prayer life or something like that is going to be very, uh, I, I think, I think that that's going to be a hard recommendation for humanitarian NGOs to understand or take on, including faith-based organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, maybe I speak out of turn. There are other people on this call that might want to say too. Um, but yeah, I just wondered how to how to bridge between that individual and then that um, um, kind of collective way that maybe some of the humanitarian organisations are thinking about their response or thinking about community based response um, and working together, um, etc. That's a really good question, Olivia, and one I frankly don't have the answer to. Um, I think it's it's going to be a um, something we have to continue to explore. I think especially the the um, the aspect I mentioned of of individuals from the refugee community themselves not feeling very cohesive within one like within their own community. Um, and I know a lot of efforts have been put into. Um, uh, facilitating cohesion between members of the host community and refugees, but maybe maybe these organizations need to step in and, and without addressing anything from a faith lens or a culture lens, is just a f increasing cohesion among um, the refugee community itself and maybe refugees from different cultural backgrounds, which will, I mean, I'm sure they have a lot of things in common in terms of learning the language and, and being able to adapt to German society in the last five years. And maybe this will take multiple generations as I mean, in the US, we obviously see this among first or second generation um, immigrants um, and their children. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to, to, to monitor over time to see if this kind of um, cohesion facilitates integration in a, in a broader sense. Um, and then on your point of faith based organizations, I think one of the most interesting things is um, that a lot of refugees um, in Germany were resettled by two of the main, I think, faith-based organizations there, Diakoni and uh, Caritas. Um, but yes, none of their programming included anything related to faith, um, neither the Christian or, or the Muslim faith. 
Um, but uh, from my cousin's experience, who was resettled as a refugee through Diakoni, he mentions just how much, how nice it was to have that, that sense of community and also a faith-based community who had their own practices, which made him feel very comforted in that they, they were you know, acting on, on faith principles. Um, so it could be something that Muslim organizations could, uh, faith-based organizations could do, um, but uh, would have to do sensitively, just given um, a lot of the political and religious persecution that these individuals have faced. Yes, it is an impossible question, so yeah. I'm trying to answer in many ways. Um, I think we are coming to the end of the call now. Um, if there's um, any other questions, um, you, you can see that on the chat, um, Diana has put her um, email address, so you're um, able to follow up and contact her um, if you want to know more about the study or more about um, her PhD research going forward and how she's going to look into more of these questions. Um, well, it's great. It's been one, I've been looking forward to actually hearing more about your research for a while. And um, so thank you so much. Um, I think um, we, of course, are interested to hear updates as well as you go along um, with the rest of your research and your PhD. Um, thank you also to um, Susanna for your response um, and um, linking us into some of the other literature and other um, your own experience about um, regarding this area too. Um, and thanks for all the participants. We'll have our next call in a month from now. Um, we're hearing from um, um, Celia Lynch about her new book. So we will, um, we will update you on that through the emails in due course. So thanks everyone for joining today um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thanks, Olivia. Thanks all, bye. Yeah.